The Montana Heritage Tour is a six-part series featuring mostly small rural museums. This project is a joint venture between the Montana Historical Society and Helena Civic Television. You can find cultural and historical treasures no matter which way you travel across the Big Sky State. The nice thing about starting in Helena is that when you drive out of town in any direction, you're going to find gold. Just about a hundred miles south by southwest from Helena is Dillon, Montana, a small city with a lot of heritage and the site of the expansive Beaverhead County Museum. As is nearly always the case, this museum is chock full of truly interesting artifacts of local and regional significance. We spent some time with Lynn Giles, director of the museum, talking about family ranches, looking at finely crafted examples of taxidermy, and even making a little music. We have a whole diversity of things. All of our exhibits have been de have been donated by the co by the residents and the families of Beaverhead County. So they they reflect the history of Beaverhead County very clearly. We talk about families. We talk about industries. We have uh, the, a mining interest. We have the beaver head hunters. We have a wonderful research facility on families. And we have a great website called the beaverheadcountymuseum.org. Well, the horse is very special. The horse is a model that stood in the window at the Dillon Implement Company, and he was the model for all of their tack and all of their saddles. And he would, his, he would change gear every once in a while. The buggy was donated by a local family to just so, show an example of how people got around here. We have the shaps. They were a very significant part of the cowboy culture. We have a case full of instruments on the um, leather making and the saddle making and all that. And on this side, we have a reference to the sheep industry and that because it was very, very important in Beaverhead County. In fact, it was a major source of, it, of income because you could buy a ewe and you'd have a lamb and you'd have a wool crop and you could sell it the first year. It took three years to develop a steer. So the sheep industry was very, very important to Beaverhead County to get it started. They shipped wool out at Menida, which is clear up on the state line with Idaho. It, they shipped wool out at Lima. They sh shipped wool and sheep out at Dell. And so it was a very big industry. Here at the Beaverhead County Museum, we try to emphasize the lives of our pioneers and the people who built this community. This side is the Bond family, and they were early on. They were doctors, they were dentists, they were merchants, and the father of the family was a surveyor who did lot, who surveyed many, many ranches here in Beaverhead County. This side is the Rife family, and the Rifes came from Canada. One brother came to town and he was a, had a dairy farm and he lived in town. He was an early mayor of Dillon. The other brother went way up the Medicine Lodge, which is almost into Idaho, and he had a sheep ranch. It's families like the Rifes and the Bonds and the Petersons that we have out front who built this community and this is a sketch of the community done in 1906. It's done by M.H. Houghton, who went through the country making these sketches of communities. This is a melodeon that Mrs. Rife brought with her from Canada, and you have to pump like a pump organ in order to get sound from the keys that look like a piano. The keyboard looks like a piano.
Lynn went on to explain that the melodeon was one element of a Spartan assembly of assets brought to the Big Sheep Creek area. This hefty musical instrument reflects the value people placed in the cultural dimension of their relatively primitive beginnings in Beaverhead County. Elsewhere in the Beaverhead County Museum, Lynn Giles showed us some unusual stuffed animals, all of which we learned are either indigenous to the area or migrate through it. The Beaverhead County Museum has a very interesting bird exhibit. These birds are the result of the taxidermy of a man named Dennis Jones, who is a local man, and he's done all of these birds. These birds have not been killed. They were discovered dead someplace by the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Bureau of Reclamation, local people, and they brought them to him, and he uh, stuffed them and set them in traditional or local settings, and the, it's amazing. He won an Audubon Award for these birds, this bird display. Sometimes you run across an exhibit that grabs your attention and won't let go. There's a space in the Beaverhead County Museum devoted to a diorama depicting the Lewis and Clark Expedition stop-off in the local area. Rudy Audio, now famous for his ceramic arts, did the work. The artist's attention to detail is remarkable to say the least. A person could look at this single display for an hour and still not see every nuance of expression and background. One of the great joys of traveling on the Heritage Tour is the chance encounter with wildlife and waterfowl along the way. These sandhill cranes near the Beaverhead Rock are just one example of many species available for viewing en route to almost anywhere in Montana. The Jefferson Valley Museum in Whitehall is a catch-all for old stuff and great stories from all over southwest Montana. There are memorabilia of all sorts, including displays of fashion, both civilian and military. An enclave depicting a period kitchen, an old-fashioned doctor's office, and venerable tools for all things agricultural, including cutting trees and bending iron. Roy Milligan is the museum's secretary, officially, but the title belies a vast spread of knowledge and memory. We started our conversation with Roy outside the main building on a breezy afternoon. We started the museum in about 1991. It came up after the celebration of the 100th anniversary for the town of Whitehall. We lo looked for a location and found this barn, which was built in 1915. The individuals that owned the ground then decided to give it to us and then, with a lot of volunteers, we reconstructed the barn as you see it today. And inside, of course, we've placed our museum pieces that have been gathered from all of southwest Montana here. And uh, we opened in 1996 to the public, so this is our 17th year being open. We're very happy with all the contributions that the individuals have made to this museum and we continue to gather artifacts today. So we're looking forward to many more visitors coming in Bissington, see what Southwest Montana artifacts look like. We've had many visitors that come back, of course alumni from a town uh, come back to the area that they left. Being a small town of about 1,200 population, everybody leaves here. So when they come back, they're looking for information about their alumni. We've had people even come back from other areas that are looking for where their ancestors ranched or farmed because this area was settled in the 1860s. And they're very happy to find out where they were located and go set foot on their places. So we get involved with genealogy as well. Roy has a soft spot for the romance of music then and now, and he's happy to do a bit of show and tell on that score. This is our music room. In here we have some items that have come back from other areas which 
individuals have brought back to Whitehall because they belong in Whitehall, belong in the museum, because this is where their family or friends used them. One case is this Victrola. It still plays. We had an individual that was able to fix it up. This came back from Missoula. It used to be stored in a basement and we had to redo some of the stuff on it. But it still plays and individuals get a kick out of it, especially kids. This is the old wind-up type, and of course we have to ch show them how you wind it up. It also has the volume control on the front, stores your records, which are 78s, down below. So it's a very interesting piece to all the especially the kids where today you just pick up a piece of equipment, hold it to your ear, or put something plugged into your ear. We also have another one that plays over here. It's a one that you can carry around. It was this boom box probably in the, back in the 1920s. If you went to pajama parties or something like this, you carried your own records with you. And of course today, when you tell kids talk to kids about a boombox, they don't even know what a boombox is anymore. Everybody, the older people that come in, remember the song, Bye Bye Blackbird. We also have Porter Johns, who is from the Cardwell area. He was a singing cowboy. He went on to sing in Bozeman over the radios when they came out in the 1920s and early 1930s. He went on to Spokane and he actually had a number one song, Gonna Hang Up My Saddle and Go, that he wrote, but was made number one by Tex Ritter. Later, Porter went on into Hollywood and performed in some movies down there as an extra and handled the horses for some of the movies in the westerns that were down there in, made, made in Hollywood. So there's always been several bands around in this country, always been music, even in the old days. They used to even go to the mines that were around here and play for the miners in those areas at the boarding houses and to keep them all entertained. Little Cardwell, Montana, just a few miles down the road from Whitehall, is the birthplace and elementary school alma mater of Chet Huntley, a world-famous television broadcaster. In the 1960s, Chet teamed up with David Brinkley to constitute a crack news anchor team for NBC. At the Jefferson Valley Museum, you can discover a whole lot about Chet Huntley's life and times. As evidenced by his grades and good looks while in high school, Huntley was one of those guys destined for greatness. Like so many other parts of Montana, this area's economy is rooted in ranching, and that legacy is manifested in practical items like spurs, horseshoes, and old brands. This is the museum's cowboy room. This collection of items in here 90% of them belong to Clyde Aiken, who started collecting items in the late 1940s. And when we go through these, why, uh, some of them have been displayed in Madison Square Garden at one time. His spur collection is wi widely known amongst horse people. You have your cavalry spur, you have your different kinds of rowels. On this Spur. This was an individual spur that was given to him. It has an Indian head on the side of it. We also have some back here. Women's legs are on the side of the spur. They were probably a special spur made for that. They have a star rowel on those 
which is different from the rest of the rowels. There's one down here that I really like. It's a little one. I'm sure that that was for the daughter when she was either one year old or at a Christmas time. It has a heart rowel on it. Up on top, you can notice the horses, the various horses that are collected by Ann Aiken, who was his daughter. They go from Red Rider on over to the Lone Ranger. We also have the brands that he collected from the different individuals. These brands were probably would never be used today because most of them are not the three-figure brand like it's required by the brand office. In another section of the museum, Roy told us about the old days when the Jefferson Valley was known as the breadbasket of southwest Montana. Jefferson Valley was at one time the uh, vegetable and produce area for the for Butte, they would, they've even raised turnips, carrots, cauliflower, potatoes in this whole area and hauled them into Butte in the early days during the, when Butte was growing up as a mining town. At one time there used to be 30 to 40 dairies in this area. Now we don't know if there's one milk cow left in Jefferson County. But there was also cheese made in this area and uh, in the early days, cheese was hauled into Butte to sell. And we had one individual that first he had a factory at Waterloo, and then moved into town to make cheese. This was his uh, cover for the cheese, which called Blue Cheese. He would take it out to Morrison Cave, which today we call Lewis and Clark Caverns, and put it in there and would age it. Of course, the coolness of the caverns is what helped the aging process of that cheese. And it was called the Swiss Creamery and Cheese Products that was made by Ernest Ager, who had operated the factory. Later, we had another uh, Whitehall Produce move in and also make cheese and ice cream in this area. The Jefferson Valley Museum has some great characters in residence. We finished our visit in a big space devoted to transportation. In the old days, as one can clearly see from the diversity of vehicles on display, folks found lots of ways to get around. It's a little under 200 miles from Helena to Lewistown, located at the geographic center of the state. Lewistown is an attractive small city built on very solid foundations, as we would soon discover at the Central Montana Museum. The facility is managed by volunteers with the Central Montana Historical Association. On the day of our visit, former board member and current volunteer Margaret Jackson Sealstead agreed to help us get our bearings in time and place. I've been a volunteer for years. I'm no longer on the board right now, but I have been uh a volunteer since we first became interested in establishing a museum back in 1953. It seems like most small museums carve out a niche or two to feature extraordinary characters of local repute or disrepute. Here in Lewistown we learned first about a law-abiding celebrity sharpshooter named Ed McGivern who also ran a local sign shop. Then Margaret gave us the lowdown on a colorful low life named Rattlesnake Jake. Well, we had our famous shooting of Rattlesnake Jake on July 4th, 1884. And uh, behind me is what somebody has decided is a replica of Rattlesnake Jake. Probably doesn't look a thing like him. And there's also what is known to be Rattlesnake Jake's skull. Rattlesnake Jake was called Rattlesnake Jake because he had shifty eyes. Margaret next told us a bit more about the Métis. The Métis came in here in 1879 and Mr. Juno established a fort about where the post office is at this time. There was Juno's fort. And a lot of uh, Métis followed into this area. They took up little settlements up and down the creek and it became kind of a settlement of the Métis people. 
And so we were always interested in the Red River carts. And of course they were made without uh, nails of any kind. And uh, they had the wheels, originally they were just solid wheels, but later they did use the spokes and they had rawhide on the outside. The thing that anybody who lived at the, here at that time remembered most about the, rattle, or the Red River carts was the fact that they sounded so horrible. They had this terrible screechy noise. They didn't put any grease on the wheels because then that would collect dust. So you just had a rawhide against rawhide and anyone who heard that sound said you'd never forget it. And so we always kind of thought that we were a home for the Red River carts. We can't reproduce the sound of a Red River cart screeching and lumbering across the prairie, but Margaret's vivid description made it easy to imagine. Lewistown is the site of an annual gathering of Métis folks from all over the state. A museum in central or northern Montana just wouldn't be complete without at least one big dinosaur. We were very, very pleased that two years ago uh, we were able to have donated to us the Taurosaurus. It was found here in um, Fergus County and that's why it's such a significant find for us. They've only found five Taurosauruses in the world and this is the fifth one because this is the last one they found <clears throat> and it's one of the largest and the most intact. And it's nine feet long and um, there's still a big discussion about the Taurosaurus, you know, related to the Triceratops because did he have a nose, you know, his horn hair or didn't he? And so there's still big discussions about if this is a different stage of a Triceratops life or, or Taurosaurus was altogether a different dinosaur. The original skull is at the Museum of the Rockies and we have just the one copy that was made in the, and to have it donated here to our county. Montana history is replete with stories about distinct ethnic groups who emigrated and worked homesteads. Shirley is descended from Croatian immigrants who came to homestead in this part of Montana. The majority of the um, Croatians that came to Lost Town came in the early 1900s and our early buildings that were here, a lot of them were made of wood and then because of fires. And someone discovered all of our wonderful sandstone that we have here that is just up our spring creek. And, and because many of them had been masons in um, Croatia, they came here and this provided a wonderful opportunity for them to patent their um, trade and then they notified their families to come and so we had many many uh, Croatians here at one time in the height and this is why Lewistown became known as the city of stone. Sometimes you encounter an item the likes of which you've never seen before like this horse racing buggy or more significantly a bombsite device that was developed and tested in secret in the 1940s when central Montana was indeed far from the madding crowds and virtually unknown to our Axis enemies. In the um, early 1940s they established a base up at our airport and the men came here to training to be uh, pilots Right after they were trained here, many of them then went overseas. But it was um, not too long lived, but it was a training site for the early part of World War II. Shirley told us that the sighting device was stored in a concrete pillbox with 24-7 security. More often than not, a visit to any small museum in Montana will bring you in close contact with military memorabilia dating from the Second World War. Before we departed from the Central Montana Museum, Shirley and Margaret reminded us of just how places like this survived the test of time. 
We're not tax supported. We're financed entirely by donations and uh, things of that kind. And so we're always looking for money so we can keep going. But we were very fortunate in having two residents here who left their entire estates in a trust for the museum. To me, the most important thing is the fact that it's all been done by volunteers. There have been two or three times when we thought we were going to have to close. It just seemed so desperate, but somebody new always came along. And from 1953 until now, we've always been able to maintain our museum. Well, I think because our museum is done chronologically, it kind of <clears throat> goes through the history of our area and it uh, displays some of the important uh, aspects of our area and highlights the different things that were actually used here. I think that it, because we've been able to use a lot of the things that are donated to show the early day businesses and early day um, business people and the people that had a very influential background of establishing our area. Thanks for tuning in to the Montana Heritage Tour. On our next venture, we'll travel east and south to Red Lodge and Columbus, and then circle back to the windy former railroad hub of Harleton. timber workers and millwrights, the small business owners and the captains of industry. They are the hands and the minds, the shoulders and the backs that made Montana. And we're proud to say that we see them in more than just museums. We see them in the people we continue to serve today. Montana State Fund, proud supporter of Montana's museums and the Montana Historical Society.